Hello, my name is Mike Ackerman and I'm a genetic cardiologist at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I also serve as director of Mayo Clinic's Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic, the Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory, and the Mayo Clinic Winland Smith Rice Comprehensive Sudden Cardiac Death Program. I am delighted that you chose to join me for today's lecture entitled Competitive Sports and Athletes with Genetic Heart Disease. Who says I can't play anyway? I hope you enjoy this 45 minute lecture as much as I will enjoy providing it as we look back on the past and still the present with respect to the, if in doubt, kick them out posture. And we retrace how the majority of cardiologists in North America and throughout the world have practiced with respect to a default towards competitive sports disqualification. And then we'll look forward to the future where more and more cardiologists will embrace and are already embracing a shared decision-making model with respect to the topic of return to play for those athletes found to have a genetic heart disease from A to Z. I hope you will consider joining me and the growing minority of cardiologists who think like this already today. This lecture has been designed to help you do just that. I hope you enjoy it. Today's lecture is entitled, Competitive Sports and Athletes with Genetic Heart Disease. Who says I can't play anyway? I hope you enjoy this. Now I'm conflicted. These are my conflicts of interest to disclose or the relationships with industry, but I don't think they're gonna negatively affect our ability today to achieve these two learning objectives. First, we're gonna assess what have been the past and the present expert opinion guidelines regarding competitive sports participation for patients with long QT syndrome and some of the other genetic heart diseases. And then we'll examine the data, the data that is compelling, albeit slowly, an evolving shift from a default disqualification posture when it comes to our patients who are athletes and who want to remain in competitive sports from that disqualification posture to shared decision making. And before we get going, I wanna pose a question to you to get your thoughts as to your wiring. When it comes to an athlete with genetic heart disease, would you allow an athlete with genetic heart disease, we'll leave it vague for now, and a prior on the field faint? Now, it was while undiagnosed and untreated, but you didn't like the sounds of that faint. You concluded it was a rhythmic syncope. Would you allow him or her to return to his or her competitive sport? Are you already a yes person, a no way, no how, or maybe? Does your answer depend on what genetic heart disease we're talking about? Is it one answer if the disease is something called long QT syndrome? Is it quite a different answer if the disease is called arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? Well, I don't know from your show of hands out there what your position is right now, but what I'd like to suggest that if you are already a definitely no, that you'd be willing to shift to maybe. And if you're a maybe, that you will be willing to consider yes as most of the time being the correct answer. But if you are a no, you have been in good company. When we pose this question to national and international audiences of oh, nearly a thousand cardiologists, no and maybe are winning by a long ways and the minority vote of yes remains in the minority. My challenge to all of us is that this minority, which is growing, deserve to grow at a faster rate because yes, often, can and should be the correct answer. But if you've been no, you've been in good company for over a quarter of a century. If we date back to 1994 and the Bethesda Conference number 26 conclusion, unless your heart is perfect, no competitive sports, period. We made an advance then some 11 years later, 2005 with Bethesda Conference 36 for North America. And I'll talk shortly about the summary from the European Society of Cardiology. But for us in North America, the update was, unless your heart is perfect or 
The syndrome is confined to just your genome. That or turns out to be a very important new advancement. But unless you're that, perfect heart or a genetic only heart, then no competitive sports, except perhaps class 1A sports. So in other words, if your genetic heart disease was this one from Task Force 4, meaning hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the answer was you're done from all competitive sports except for class 1A, no matter what kind of HCM you have, obstructive, non-obstructive, no matter how it's being treated with or without an ICD, you are done from all sports except 1A. ARVC for the cardiomyopathy, you should be excluded from most competitive sports except for perhaps class 1A. And I'm not gonna focus much time on it except to say this is probably the only genetic heart disease, certainly the only cardiomyopathy or channelopathy where the evidence since 2005 is growing and is quite strong that excessive competitive sports participation in high intensity sports is in fact a disease accelerator. I don't think we have data to say that for any other cardiomyopathy. How about non-compaction cardiomyopathy? It's prudent to be done from all sports except for 1A, we said in 2005. If we turn to the cardiac channelopathies, that was Task Force 7 back in 2005, and the answer was pretty simple. X is the default answer. In other words, you are done from all competitive sports if you have any disease called a cardiac channelopathy. For the most common of the cardiac channelopathies, that of long QT syndrome, we said that you are relegated to only class 1A sports if you had symptomatic long QT syndrome or asymptomatic long QT syndrome, but we could make the diagnosis with an abnormal electrocardiogram with those QTC cutoffs, greater than 470 in the men, greater than 480 in the, in the women. And here was the wiggle room that the Bethesda Conference 36 carved out. This turns out to be really important that we gave wiggle room to the genotype positive, phenotype negative patients, that we gave them the okay to play in virtually all competitive sports. In other words, if your disease was in the genetic state only, where the only reason we knew you had the disease susceptibility was a positive genetic test result, that perhaps the strict uh, disqualifications that were being levied to those with clinically manifest disease weren't appropriate for those who have genetically confined disease or so-called genotype positive but phenotype negative. So again, 15 years and running now, we've said unless your heart is perfect or that syndrome is confined to just your genetic code, just your genome, no competitive sports, except perhaps class 1A sports. And by now, I hope you got some, you have some negative tension and energy about what are these so-called class 1A sports, and please tell me there's something good in there for me to offer that athlete who I'm shutting down by guidelines from all sports except for 1A. Well, there's not. This was Task Force 8 where we uh, levied and binned the sports based upon their dynamic component on the x-axis and their static component on the y-axis. And it really didn't matter what this exercise resulted in as to where your sport of choice or where their sport of choice resided because if it wasn't in the bottom left-hand corner, the 1A box, it was unavailable to them by guidelines. In other words, you are restricted from all competitive sports by guidelines except for, yes, billiards, bowling, cricket, curling, golf, and riflery. These were declared as the safe six sports. You need to say that quite carefully. Now, it is interesting, a couple of the sports who are shown here, and it's interesting to see the fallout of it. Do you know out there who is the most offended by the 1A designation? You got it, the cricketeers. They are incensed, infuriated in fact, that how dare their sport get boxed in the lowest dynamic component and the lowest static component sport. They think that their sport deserves more respect 
than that, and they don't want to be in the 1A box. And then riflery. Think about that one. You just tell your athlete who loves their sport, their sport is oxygen, that they're going to now be disqualified from it, cannot pursue it, but take up a gun. I don't think I want to do that. And here's the recent news flash, the top of the hour flash news update. Guess what? Billiards is now declared as too dangerous, no longer worthy of being part of the safe six. And instead, billiards has been replaced by yoga. So these are they, the sports that we can offer by guidelines as belonging in the safe six sport category. And as you have probably realized in your practice, not many of our patients are arriving doing these sports as their sport of choice. Now what at the same time was happening across the pond in Europe? In 2005, the European Society of Cardiology went retro and quite elegant in its simplicity as they just said, unless your heart is perfect, no competitive sports, period. You don't get bowling, you don't get cricket, you don't get curling, you won't even get yoga there. In other words, we started to have an issue set up across the Atlantic Ocean where on our side in North America, we said if your disease is only there, they're being right there in the genetic code. And that's the only reason we know you have susceptibility for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, for example, and that we can't see it electrically, echocardiographically, you could play. Uh, European society at that time said, forget about it. Positive genetic test result alone, you're done. Gene carriers, you are done. And in fact, for long QT syndrome, the 2005 guidelines advise disqualification from all competitive sports, every single one, for any long QT patient. Doesn't matter symptomatic or asymptomatic state. And check out these thresholds. By their guidelines, a man with a QTC of 441, woman with a QTC of 461, should be disqualified from everything. As an aside, I wish they would adhere to uh, this recommendation because it would remove about 5 to 10% of all Olympic athletes because they would easily exceed these QTC thresholds. And remember that carve-out that we created with the Bethesda Conference 36 of the person who only has a positive genetic test and otherwise you and I as cardiologists, as phenotypers, as clinicians, we cannot make the diagnosis. No such wiggle room in the ESC. Genotype positive, phenotype negative patients are not given the okay to play. In other words, a positive genetic test result alone is self-sufficient to disqualify you from everything in accordance with ESC 2005. For long QT syndrome, look at what we have going on. We said patients with concealed long QT syndrome may be allowed to participate in virtually all sports. If we can't see it, you can do it. Whereas in European Society of Cardiology, forget about that, manifest long QT, concealed long QT, you are done. Gene carriers, you are done. A positive genetic test by itself, you are done. Do you get what we are talking about here? It's rather amazing, if you think about it, that this, meaning a positive genetic test alone, is self-sufficient for disqualifying you from everything. And what's the evidence that this is the case? Here's the evidence. Look closely. Keep looking. Look closely. There is no evidence. And this inadvertently introduced the possibility of genetic discrimination for our patients who happen to be athletes whose only portal of entry to discovery is a positive genetic test with no manifest phenotypic indicators of disease of concern. What's the reason why we have this discordance? Well, some of it was revealed in the, in the 
impressive, I would say, transparency of our document back in 2005. We said, and we acknowledge, that our recommendations are based largely on individual and collective judgments and experiences, and that we're invoking, in part, the art of medicine with these recommendations. This is very different than the huge patient-driven data sets from hypertension, atrial fibrillation, heart failure, that gives significant data and evidence that, that underpin the recommendation. These are level of evidence, C, expert opinion. And are we conveying that to our patients? Are we telling them that when I'm disqualifying you from your sport that you love, that we're being rather artistic in our recommendation with the art of medicine? We said that this will occasionally cause some athletes to be withdrawn from competition unnecessarily. But we acknowledge that this is too bad, so sad, because it's a controllable risk factor. And the way we control, we the cardiologists control that risk is we do not sign the paper that lets you back onto the team. And that's how we do it. And we underscored or we said that this underscores the wisdom of the conservative nature of these recommendations. In other words, translation, if in doubt, kick them out, has been the guidance from the cardiology community for the past 25 plus years. Now what might be the elephant in the room that further drives this default towards disqualification, towards if in doubt, kick them out? Perhaps it's some cases like this with the basketball player, Mr. Knapp in Northwestern University some 23 years ago. And even though that it's not clear about a malpractice liability, there remains great concern that if you and I as a cardiologist were to support a return to play for an athlete where the guidelines have stated a recommendation for disqualification, albeit an expert opinion-driven recommendation, that there could be malpractice liability if that cleared athlete had an event. And that concern probably most clearly distinguishes our tilting towards disqualification from competitive sports, but we want you to stay active recreationally. In other words, if you don't need my permission to do it, we encourage you to do it. If you need our permission, I'm not signing the papers. And I think uh, consciously or subconsciously, this fear of malpractice liability is the elephant in the room and is a driver for the, if in doubt, kick them out predisposition. But then it's interesting that the wind started to change and blow in a different direction and has been blowing now for the past six plus years because we started to see different guidelines emerge like this one from Heart Rhythm Society, European Heart Rhythm Association and the Asian Pacific Heart Rhythm Society where they said as a class one recommendation, all long QT patients who wish to engage in competitive sports should be referred to a clinical expert for evaluation of risk. Now why, why? would you need to go see an expert to be told you're done from all competitive sports? So something started to happen at the guideline level. And in fact, that happening continued with the latest American Heart Association and American College of Cardiology scientific statement, now four years old. What did we say then? And this scientific statement replaces the Bethesda Conference statements. We said for the channelopathies that the de facto X, the de facto disqualification has been rescinded. And instead, we specified several important considerations. For long QT syndrome, for example, look here. We emphasized and reemphasized the 2013 recommendation of see an expert. And as you'll see, in order to embrace the notion of shared decision-making, the athletes and their families need to be well-evaluated, well-diagnosed, well-treated, well-risk-stratified so that they can be well-counseled so that they can have shared decision-making 
truly occur. See an expert as you as you deliberate over these issues. We said second, what did we say? Look here, we arbitrarily chose three months for that athlete to be in the penalty box if they've been symptomatic. In other words, we embrace sort of a concussion-like protocol where you need to be put in a penalty box until you can be carefully evaluated and diagnosed and treated and so forth. In other words, you can't have your concussion on Friday and be reinstated into the football game on Saturday. Similarly, you can't have an on-the-field faint that sounds concerning occur on Friday and be reinstated on the soccer field on Saturday. We need a timeout. Now, whether we need full three months, that was completely arbitrary. We chose it to create the pause so that the evaluation and the counseling could all take place. We said that after 15 years later, there's still no evidence to disqualify an individual based solely on their DNA, based solely on their genetic test result. In other words, a positive genetic test result alone is not self-sufficient to warrant a disqualification recommendation. And if we are doing so based solely on a genetic test result, that is genetic discrimination. We also then said specifically for long QT syndrome that even this, that is, even a symptomatic athlete or one who is asymptomatic but has a long QT interval, they may be able to return to play. In other words, we've seen this transition from a guideline standpoint emerge. We've come from 25 years ago and even longer, really the past half century, from an if in doubt, kick them out, to unless your heart is perfect or the syndrome is confined to just your genome, to after you have been well evaluated, well risk stratified, well treated, and well informed, a return to play may be possible. This is a dramatic evolution over the past half century. In other words, shared decision making is making its way, has made its way to sports cardiology. And the traction of shared decision making is growing. I referred you to this on the mind and on my mind that I had the privilege of doing with Aaron Bagish and Rachel Lampert. If you would like to look into this in more detail. Are you wired towards shared decision making in your practice? Well, I am, and I have been for a long time. When I started my career in 2000, joining the faculty of Mayo Clinic at that time, I rejected the if in doubt, kick them out philosophy. And instead, I thought, why doesn't this work for our field as well. In other words, what we do in so much of medicine at Mayo Clinic and throughout the world. In other words, respect patient and family autonomy and respect their right to make a well-informed decision. I thought that this was the right philosophy for my patients with genetic heart diseases, with sudden death predisposing genetic heart diseases, even those where sports participation could and should be viewed as a possible risk-taking behavior, that nevertheless, that this philosophy was the right one. I embraced this philosophically 20 years ago, and I still embrace the philosophy, but I'm now buttressed by data. The data comes largely from our own program, but now increasingly from other programs throughout the world. And we've been examining and watching this, monitoring this very closely. We've been following our patients who come to us uh, for their long QT evaluation, risk stratification, and treatment recommendations. Now, not everybody who comes to Mayo Clinic are athletes, and if they're not an athlete on arrival, I'm certainly not going to try to steer them towards competitive sports engagement. But many choose to come to Mayo for their care, and they are athletes. And one of the things we noticed uh, very early on in our program was something that fully de debunked a myth that's out there. And that myth that is out there goes something like this. You know, if we give the athlete and his family the choice to return to the sport, 
they will always return. They will never self-disqualify. Well, that's, that's not true. In fact, highly motivated athletes and their families who have flown over several medical centers to come for their Mayo Clinic evaluation with this explicit desire to get back to their sport of choice after coming, they chose, they chose disqualification. And we continue to see about a 20% self-imposed, family-imposed disqualification. These families fully can choose to disqualify uh, after they assess everything on their own. Now, 80% hear everything, and they choose to remain an athlete. Of those who chosen to remain an athlete, this is the profile initially, and there's many, many more since this original study from seven years ago. And you can see a snapshot of the patients, their average age at diagnosis, 11, their QTC, 22% have had a symptom. Most are treated with beta blockers. Only 15% possess an internal defibrillator. And of these, guess what? When they arrive, their sport of choice is just not down there in the 1A box of billiards, bowling, cricket, and you know the rest. Instead, this is what they arrive doing, and we do not try to get them one box closer to 1A. Instead, what we really ask our patients and the families for them to consider are the two O's. Is the sport O optional, or is the sport O oxygen? And the closer they discover for themselves that it's in the optional category, guess what? They're tilting themselves towards self-disqualification. For those where that sport is the equivalent to oxygen, is passion, we try to figure out, can we keep that as a vital part of their life? We don't try to get them one box closer to bowling or to take up billiards besides the fact Billiards is no longer on the safe six list. Remember, it's too dangerous. Now it's yoga. In other words, look here. Look, look at these athletes. This is who they are. Now, you might say we don't have very many in the high-risk age or the high-risk sport, and that's actually quite wrong if you understand the disease. When is long QT expressivity the greatest? It's the greatest in the prepubertal boys. And so we have a relatively higher risk cohort and we have them involved in multiple sports. And we even have the athletes who have the sport dangerous genetic version. In other words, type one long QT syndrome where we already know that the LQT1 associated triggers tend to be adrenaline related, emotion, exertion related, the thrill of victory, the agony of defeat. And despite having over half of all of our long QT athletes having that genetic subtype, look at what's happened to them. What has happened to these 130 athletes who after their evaluation, after their risk stratification, after their treatment plan has been uh, confirmed or optimized? One. We've had one long QT athlete who has experienced two events in the first 650 plus athlete years of observation. That's the observational data. Were we surprised about this particular athlete? Mm, not really. He was 11 years old, LQT1, very impressive QT interval, out of hospital cardiac arrest starting in kindergarten, age five two appropriate ICD shocks while warming up to play soccer and baseball. After optimizing his care further with denervation therapy, he has now been event free for the past five, six years and has completed high school level and collegiate level sports of choice. Now you notice he did have an ICD. Now remember in our long QT cohort that I shared with you just now, only 15% of those long QT athletes possessed a defibrillator. But let's talk for a little bit about the defibrillator. What are the guideline recommendations if you own one of these and it's implanted? Well, you see by guidelines, the presence of an ICD is disqualifying from virtually everything except for the safe six. If you have one of these, you're disqualified by the guidelines. Now, this was not and has not been embraced uniformly by the 
cardiac electrophysiology community, the community of heart rhythm specialists. In fact, pioneering work that started now over 13 years ago by Rachel Lampert at Yale University and others showed, even back then, that over 50% of us, the community of heart rhythm specialists, did not agree with this conclusion. And we've been studying this under Dr. Lampert's leadership, and ICD Sports Registry was established. Now, that was viewed back then as rather an anthema, right? How can you have an ICD and a sports registry when an ICD and sports should not go together? But indeed, they do go together, and we are currently following well over 400 athletes throughout the country and throughout the world who have ICDs and have been entered into the sports registry. And six years ago, we summarized our initial observations. Yes, there will be appropriate shocks. 13% in the first three years have had an appropriate shock. Yes, there will be inappropriate shocks at a similar rate to those observed in non-athletes. And these are the genetic heart diseases and non-genetic heart diseases represented. Number one lesion, long QT syndrome. Number two, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And among these, in fact, all of these, especially long QT syndrome, we have seen zero, zero increased risk of mortality, death to the athlete, or damage to the ICD. No difference have we seen compared to that of the general population. So the registry would suggest that we are simply not seeing increased danger to the athlete with an ICD or increased damage to the athlete's ICD itself. Now we've updated this recently just as two years ago with longer follow-up, nearly four years of follow-up, and we're continuing to see and about 10% of our athletes with defibrillators getting an appropriate shock. The rate is about three shocks per 100 person years among the entire collection of athletes and still no increased signal of danger to the host or damage to the device. What is our own experience, which we just published last year? This was of my 322 athletes at the time with genetic heart disease. Now I currently follow probably closer to 400 athletes myself who have some sort of genetic heart disease. In this 322, you see most of them, 259, have long QT syndrome. What's the bottom line? Nine of them, less than 3%, have experienced a non-lethal cardiac event. I repeat, a non-lethal cardiac event in nearly 1,000 combined athlete years of follow-up. In other words, our event rate among our diagnosed, risk-stratified, and treated athletes with genetic heart disease have been 0.9 non-lethal events per 100 athlete years. Our lethal event rate continues to be zero and has been zero for the past 20 years of my practice. Again, here is our bottom line. And the event rate has been a sub 1% non-lethal event rate. And guess what? Look at this. Who would you guess the event rate is lower in? Maybe it's a paradox to you, it's not to me, but our athletes have a lower event rate, already low at less than 1% and non-lethal, I would remind us, than the former athletes and our never athletes, which I didn't show on this slide. And what might be behind what is viewed by some as a paradox as to why continued sports participation seems to be safer? Could it be that the athletes have a lower risk version of disease to begin with and that's why they chose to stay and play? And the former athletes had a worse version of disease and they got the aha moment to get out in the nick of time? No. If we look at the risk profile or the disease phenotype in the athletes, the non-athletes, and the never-athletes, the disease predicted forecast would be actually the same. I think 
The reason instead is something that is common among true athletes. Discipline. Following the plan. Being driven. Wanting, desiring to stay an athlete. So following the recommendation, the treatment program to a T. Being compliant. Sleeping well. Eating right. Training right not missing their medication because they want to stay doing what they have concluded as being oxygen for them. Now we continue to study this and Dr. Lampert and Charlene Day and I have had the privilege of being the principal investigators for this NIH funded study, the first of its kind really, where we have now enrolled over 2,000 individuals from eight to 65 with long QT syndrome. We've enrolled a similar number with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, athletes, non-athletes, whatever they are and whatever they're doing, and enrollment has been completed. And we are now testing this hypothesis that those with either long QT or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy who are the most active will have a higher quality of life than those who are the least active without experiencing more disease-associated cardiac events. Stay tuned. We hope to know the answer, or at least the short-term answer, in the next three years as we are now following these patients with active enrollment being completed. If in doubt, kick them out. Hopefully, I've showed you and convinced you that maybe you should consider embracing a different philosophy. So if Perhaps you're ready to leave an if-in-doubt, kick-them-out position and instead embrace respecting patient and family autonomy and their right to make a well-informed decision. I hope you're ready to do this. If you're ready to do this, then I need to urge you uh, and emphasize six critical caveats. First, you and I should ask ourselves, am I the right person to be doing this? You already saw the 2013 guidelines said they should see an expert. That really is to enable the patient, the family, the athlete to be well-evaluated, well-diagnosed, well-risk-stratified, well-treated so they can be then well-informed. And it's okay to conclude that I might not be the best person for this family and refer them. We should ask ourselves, Am I the right person to be doing this? Second, I think we must mandate whenever possible, and especially for our minor athletes or athletes who are minors, that the athlete and his or her parents must be in agreement. I've shown you that 20% of all of the athletes who come to Mayo Clinic, those athletes and their families concluded with a vote to disqualify. And we allow the disqualification recommendation to stick, to hold, with one veto vote from one of those three critical members of the team. The athlete, his mother, her mother, his father, her father. We must be in one accord on this. And you can can imagine why that has been uh, an important caveat in our program for two decades. This is, at some level a risk-taking behavior, and the family unit must be on the same page. You can only imagine what would happen if there is a lethal event that were to occur among that return-to-sport athlete, and if, besides the tragedy of that death, if one of the parents wasn't in agreement, two tragedies will be on our hands. That, That athlete's death and that parent, those parents, and their union, their marriage. They need, we need to work with them to be on the same page. And until they are, I keep them disqualified. Three, there can be no covert operations. The appropriate coaches, school officials, trainers, and so forth, they must be informed. No covert operations are permitted in our program. Number four, The athlete must have his or her automatic external defibrillator as part of their sports safety gear. Now, this can probably be liberated for the small subset of athletes who already own an internal defibrillator. 
But for those who don't have one, they should have an AED. Now, will they use it? Almost for sure, no. In fact, none of my athletes to date have ever required the AED. It has not been used yet in a single athlete in our program for 20 years. Number five, we need to emphasize to them that there is no such thing as SDM, shared decision making, when it comes to the athlete who's at the university level, particularly Division I university, or at the professional level. At, that, at those levels, it will be TDM, their decision making, or BDM, business decision making model that's embraced and utilized. And I think we owe it to the athletes and their families to make them fully aware that what we may conclude together as the unit team of the patient family physician relationship may hold little weight at the university or professional level. Prior to those levels, almost always our athletes who we have supported their return to play have returned to play. Uh, when it comes to the university or professional level in my own practice, our batting average is 50%. In other words, at least half of those athletes and families where we have been supportive of their return to play, the university or their professional team has said, that's your decision, that is not our decision. We are doing business decision making. And number six, and of course for that elephant in the room, document. It needs to be made explicitly clear that you have fully discussed the issues. In fact, most of my notes include this paragraph. I have discussed this with the athlete and his or her parents. I have answered all of their questions. They are proceeding with eyes wide open. They know that there is no such thing as zero risk. They know that even with a readily available AED, he or she could die suddenly. And part of our yearly evaluations with our athletes is to update them as to what has been the experience of our athletes who have chosen to return to play. Is the lethal rate still zero? Is the AED use rate still zero? So that they can be updated with this information so that that could be included in their calculus as to whether it still is quote unquote worth it for them to stay engaged in what they are choosing to do. Document. So this brings us to the, the take home points. And I want to give you six additional take-home points for who says I can't play anyway. I've tried to illustrate during our last 35 minutes together that we should acknowledge that philosophy and art, the art of medicine, currently trump science and evidence as the underpinnings of the sports participation guidelines. And if that is true, then I think athletes and their families have the right to know what is the evidence or the lack of evidence that's going into your and my recommendation when we say you're disqualified? Number three, I would suggest that the earlier guidelines were not only too strict, but they also inadvertently advocated genetic discrimination. And I'm delighted to update you with uh, the latest European Society of Cardiology guidelines for the cardiomyopathies have now moved away from the default positive genetic test and you're disqualified. That is no longer true in 2019. So even there, progress continues to be made. And I think this genetic discrimination is going to be a thing of the past throughout the world when it comes to athletes with genetic heart disease. Number four, I think we have debunked the myth that athletes and their families cannot disqualify themselves. That's not true. We see it time and again that these families, these athletes are fully capable to choose to disqualify themselves. And our family athlete imposed self-disqualification continues to be about 20%, even though they are often flying to Mayo Clinic explicitly to get reinstated into their sport of choice. They can choose to disqualify themselves. 
Number five, among those who chose to remain a long QT athlete, and I could also add the data, an athlete with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and even an athlete with CPVT, their disease triggered event rate has been extremely low. The lethal event rate remains zero for two decades now. The non-lethal event rate remains at just under 1% chance per year. The need of an automatic external defibrillator to rescue any of our athletes has remained at zero as well. And most of our athletes do not possess an internal defibrillator. What should we tell or ask ourselves as well? I think we should probably acknowledge that, certainly in North America, that the fear of malpractice liability is the proverbial elephant in the room that most distinguishes competitive sports, which we have had a tendency to, if in doubt, kick them out, from recreational activities, which we've had a tendency to say, you should stay active and do those things as long as you don't need my uh, explicit permission. We also should recognize that the role of disqualifier is actually easy. It's a 30 second conversation. Just say no. Whereas the role of an informer educator can and does take hours. So be ready and be patient to take quite some time for all parties involved to come to the same best decision for that family unit. Again, like I said with the important first caveat, it's okay to ask ourselves, am I the right person to be doing this? And to conclude that maybe I'm not, and the least I can do for this family involved is the direct is to direct them to a specialty center for them to help engage in the evaluation, risk stratification, treatment, and counseling session to enable true shared decision making to occur. Finally, I'm often asked, when are sports not worth the risk, Mike? And I have concluded that perhaps when a well-informed athlete and his or her family concludes so, then it's not worth the fact, the risk, or when the data clearly compels such a conclusion. I don't think the data compels this conclusion for long QT syndrome as I've shared. On the other hand, I do think the data is compelling this conclusion for the genetic cardiomyopathy of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy or ARVC. Data is compelling that recommendation, which we have been embracing, to steer those athletes with that cardiomyopathy away from many competitive sports, certainly away from high intensity, high endurance training sports. So when the data is there, we should use that data, inform the families of that data, so that data, so that information can be incorporated. Well, this has brought us to the end of our 40-minute time together, and I look forward to soon coming back with you uh, face-to-face for some f- summarizing uh, comments. But before I do so, I do want to acknowledge those entities that have partnered with our program with the Winland Smith Rice Sudden Death Genomics Laboratory, particularly the philanthropic support from Wendy's family to help us try to heal the sick and advance the science. I'd also like to invite you to join us in this upcoming October and every October for that matter for Mayo Clinic's Department of Cardiovascular Medicine's Genetics of Heart and Vascular Disease course. We would love to spend the weekend together with you. And with that, I will be back shortly with you face-to-face for some final comments. Thanks for joining me today. I hope that these past 45 minutes have helped to give you the confidence to embrace this shared decision-making approach when it comes to the next athlete that you encounter with genetic heart disease. Don't forget those six critical caveats if you are indeed ready to join those of us who wish to take care of our patients in this manner. Number one, ask yourself if you are the right person to be doing this. 
If you're not, refer that family, that athlete and their family to see an expert to help them be evaluated, treated, and counseled in a manner that they deserve and need. Number two, remember that the family must be on the same page. Number three, no covert operations. Number four, establish the safety plan that includes an automatic external defibrillator as part of their athletic gear. Number five, prepare the family and his or her family in advance that while you and they are practicing shared decision making, that may not and often will not occur at the university and the professional level. And number six, document. Well, I trust that you enjoyed listening to this presentation as much as I enjoyed providing it for you. On behalf of Mayo Clinic's Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic and the Mayo Clinic Winland Smith Rice Comprehensive Sudden Cardiac Death Program, thanks for joining me today.